in part two of our examination of empiricism, we are looking more carefully at John Locke, and we left in part one with a challenge. How does our perception of the tree happen? What is the theory of perception that you can explain how our experience of the tree occurs? So we have this idea where there's a tree in the external world on the right side here, and we have a thought of the tree that's within our mind. And, and yes, go ahead and marvel at the artwork here. So the question is, how is your mind connected to the external world? How does this happen? One option that's really odd uh, for an option, but and it's useful to think it through, is solipsism. And solipsism is the thesis that the only thing that exists is your mind and its contents, nothing else. It's just you. Sure, you are having an experience of watching this video, of, of having a screen in front of you, but that's just something that you are experiencing in your mind. You cannot get from inside your mind to outside the mind. It, it just doesn't make any sense. How could you? You're just experiencing what you're experiencing. There is no external world. If you can't get to the external world, you're just kind of stuck as a solipsist. So the solipsist says, I don't need a theory to explain how the contents of my mind relate to the external world because there is no external world, and that just solves the problem. Now, uh, Russell, Bertrand Russell told the story about how he was lecturing and explained solipsism to someone, and after the lecture, a woman came up to him and said, I am so glad that you are a solipsist. I am too, and it's comforting to know that there are others. All right, think about it. Locke had a strategy for avoiding solipsism. And this is really significant for his theory. Now, one reason he says that solipsism fails is because we lack control over what we see and hear and smell, etc. cetera. Our, our perceptions that we experience in the world, we don't have control of them. If we were solipsism, if, if solipsism were true, why wouldn't you have better experiences, you know, control things? Why wouldn't you be on a sunny beach by, you know, enjoying a nice drink? If, if you were me, that's what I think I would uh, like to be doing. But there is a second issue with solipsism, and that is we have very consistent experiences. And the consistency of our experiences is best explained by a, an actual, a, a real external world. We go to the same places we, we in your home, you, your bathroom is always the same, right? Your bedroom's in the same place and the details, it's always the same. So how do you explain that? Well, there must be an external world providing those experiences to us. So Locke does think we have the internal world and the external world, the internal world of the mind and the external world causing our sensations. So external objects cause our sen sensations, but they do so in two ways, according to Locke. One way is through the primary qualities that objects have. These are actual qualities that the objects in the external world have, and they cause our perception of those objects in the external world. These include motion. So when something's moving, that's an actual characteristic of the external world and we can perceive it. These include number. So if you're looking at trees, there are five trees, say, and those are actually trees in the external world. Shapes, the, the shape of the tree, the leaf that you look at more closely, the, the circle drawn on the blackboard, these are actual objects in the external world that cause their sensation and again size. Um, you can draw something uh, one foot or something might be 
10 feet long and something might be 10 feet high, et cetera, et cetera. The, the size of the objects in the external world are actually there and they cause our sensation so that we perceive these primary qualities of objects. These are stable. They don't change according to our own personal position or our mood or our perspective or whether or not we're ill. Um, so if you were to pick up a pen and hold it in front of you, you know, you can see that it's a certain length, about six inches, say. It's uh, cylindrical. It, uh, you know, it's black, et cetera. I shouldn't say it's black, sorry. That's a, not a primary quality. It's cylindrical, that's its shape. There's one of them, it has a size. And if you move it in front of your face it, or put it still, you can observe those characteristics and those are characteristics of the pen in the external world. These primary qualities that we experience in our mind resemble the qualities of the objects that exist in the external world. But external objects cause sensations in another way, through secondary qualities. And here's where I, I mistakenly mentioned color as a primary quality, it's a secondary quality. Uh, tastes, smells, sounds, especially the pitch of sounds, colors, being hot or cold, these qualities are experienced within our mind, but do not exist out there in the external world. They're caused by effluvium or, or various shapes of things and the motion of things. They're caused by the primary qualities of the things in the external world. So the ideas we have of objects, secondary qualities, do not resemble the qualities of the objects. Objects in the external world don't actually have a flavor or an odor or a sound or, or, or heat or cold. They have motion. They have number, they have size, and they, they have certain shape. That's it. Uh, so our secondary qualities that we experience are entirely in our mind. So now we could redraw this uh, description of, of experiencing the tree a little differently. So the shape of the tree is in the external world, and it's also in our mind. And so the shape of the tree resembles, in our mind, it resembles the shape in the external world. Shape is a primary quality. And we can say the same thing about motion and number and size. But the color green that we experience, that's a secondary quality. And it exists only in the mind. It doesn't exist out there in the external world. Why does he think that? Because of the variance argument that we considered in part one. So let's think about this a little bit more. What, what's the support for the variance argument? Well, consider some experiments that you could actually do. Imagine uh, three buckets of water. On your right is a bucket with water 100 degrees. On your left is a bucket of water with 35 degrees. And in the middle is a bucket of water with 70 degree water. Okay, so what would happen if you stuck your right hand in the hot water, the left hand in your cold water, and you left them there for about a minute, they, allowing them to get acclimated. Your left hand starts to feel very cold. Your right hand is quite warm. You take them out of those buckets and you put both hands in the middle bucket. How, what are you going to experience? Well, with your right hand, you're going to experience that middle bucket as being cold. With your left hand, you're going to experience the middle bucket as being warm. They're, the colors, I mean, uh, the temperature varies according to your own perception. So it's not actually in the water. So if the heat or the cold is in the water, then both hands would sense it the same once you've put them both in the middle bucket. But of course, both hands do not sense it to be the same. 
and therefore the hotness or the coldness of the water is not actually in the water. It's merely in our perception of the water in our mind. So temperature, the sensations of hot and cold, those exist in our mind, not in the external world. So what's going on in the external world to cause the differences? We talked about 100 degree water and 35 degree water. Well, it would be the motion of the water, how fast it's, the molecules are moving around. That's real. The shape of those molecules, that's real. And the speed, they're going faster in the hot water, slower in the cold water. That's what we're sensing, but our mind senses it as warmth or coolness. And that is only in our mind. So this is going to be true for all of the secondary qualities. They exist only in our mind. So it also works. You could run the same argument. You could give similar examples with colors, with pitches of sounds, with odors, etc. Let's go ahead and try an experiment right now. You can participate in the experiment here. What I want you to do is close your left eye, close your left eye, put your hand over your left eye, whatever, don't look at the screen with your left eye, just focus on the right, uh, with your right eye on the dot. Okay, now keep your left eye closed as you focus on the dot in the screen. Now hopefully you have a, a vivid red there on your screen that you can see with your right eye, keeping your left eye closed, keeping your hand over your left eye. And I promise I'm not gonna try to hypnotize you here as you continue to focus on that dot. Just focus right on the dot in the middle of the screen. And you know the redness you observe, Locke is going to argue, exists in your mind, but not actually on the screen. So it could vary according to the sensations. The color of your screen is something that can vary according to you. Don't open your left eye yet, right? Keep it closed until I say so, which is coming up now. Okay, now close your right eye, look at the screen with your left eye, what color is it? Okay, now close your left eye, look at the screen with your right eye. Go back and forth, left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye. It varies, right? So Locke says, since it's varying, we can run the same argument. It doesn't exist in the real world. If it did, we would perceive it the same with both eyes. And since we don't, it doesn't exist in the world. It only exists in our mind. And so, for Locke, we have that clear-cut distinction. We have objects that do exist in the external world. They have number, motion, shape, and size. Those cause us to have experiences. The, our experiences of the primary qualities match what, we, what is actually in the external world, and the experience of the secondary qualities is only in our mind. So the knowledge we have comes through our senses. Locke says we start with a blank slate, uh, a tabula rasa, and uh, it, our experiences provide us with everything that we know, right? Reflection is not grounded in the way that Descartes described, and, and, and it doesn't have that pure solid foundation as dark Descartes requested, you know, sought after, but it is grounded. It is reasonable to think that our experiences are broadly reliable. And so that is the explanation of how we gain knowledge. This idea of certainty is just simply too high of a standard for knowledge. So we don't worry about it. We just rely on our senses. 